good evening everybody and dr vinita ramnani uh, uh, chairperson scientific committee mp state now uh, we we are having a second uh, webinar for our perceptors of future it's a pg uh, webinar it's a competitive webinar so we have all six judges and we have three coordinators uh, i request uh, dr aditi to introduce uh, today's uh, speakers a very good evening everyone so with the second uh, uh, this is second in line first we had gopal today we have gwalior pg is from gwalior they'll be presenting today they have been uh, given the topic well in advance so we have five speakers from gwalior dr uh, smita dr vanshika patel dr varsha sharma dr shreya tripathi and dr neharika chaurasia they have been given various topics and a mentor uh, is allotted to them Uh, Dr. D.K. Shakya, Dr. Rashmi Khajur, Dr. Prabha Gupta, and Dr. Punendra Basin. So we'll be starting with our first presentation. Uh, Dr. Smita, she is she'll be presenting. No. Uh, Smita has to tell the rule, and even Dr. Rajji uh, uh, Gupta uh, sir has joined, so he will also um, yes, we give the welcome address. Yes, and Dr. Shweta will be telling you the rules uh, of the presentation, and. Uh, So I request Dr. Rajiv to welcome all uh, speakers, mentors, and uh, the coordinators and judges. Dr. Rajiv Gupta, sir, please. We can't hear you, sir. probably your audio is not working sir you can uh, log out and rejoin sir probably you are not chosen the audio so you can rejoin sir Uh, meanwhile, I request Dr. Shweta Walia to give the rules for judges as well as the presenters. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we welcome you all to the preceptors of future for the uh, Gwalior division. So we have five presentations today, and our judges are Dr. Manav Sethia, Dr. Amit Porwal is has not yet joined, Dr. Himanshu Shukla, Dr. Rakesh Shatkia will be joining soon, Dr. Praveen Khare. will be joining soon and dr shubhra mehta each presenter is being given 5 minutes to present his video on the topic that is allotted the presentation will be judged by our six judges out of 100 marks and they are subdivided into five subheads with each 20 marks the quality of presentation way of presentation relevance of content adherence to time and slide management and discussion the timer will be displayed on the screen and i'll say time up at 5 minutes and uh, the judges can take down the note whether the presenter has completed it in well in time so best of luck to all the presenters and with this uh, we request dr rajiv gupta sir to give a welcome note hello yes sir now you are audible actually i have joined through the mobile my laptop was probably not working well good evening everybody good evening all the students who have joined this is the second in series of the webinars uh, organized by scientific committee so i congratulate dr virita for organizing such a wonderful event for enrichment of the knowledge uh, of the students so i welcome all the students all the pgs who has actually worked very hard to present their presentations and uh, i hope definitely i hope that is going to really help them a lot and i congratulate the judges also i wish they will be very fair they will be impartial and they will be quite helpful to all the pgs all the students not merely this time but to the in the future also as the topics and the pre captures as i wish in future 
they're definitely going to perform really well. So I welcome you all, and I'm not take, going to take a long time. Once again, wishing you all the best. You can start, please. Thank you so much, sir. Um, as uh, other judges are not there, I request Dr. Raditi and Dr. Shweta to please do the judging. And we will start with uh, Dr. Sadayaja Smita. She will be speaking on recent advances in presbyopia. And uh, the mentor okay. is Dr. D.K. Shakya, sir. So please uh, share your screen, stick to the time, and be confident. All the best. Good evening, everyone. Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, you uh, are. Uh, Ma'am, my slide is visible? Yes. You can start. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Sadhija Smita. I would like to thank all my esteemed teacher to provide me this opportunity to present my views on recent advances in press biopic correction. So what is press biopia? Press biopia is a physiological reduction in amplitude of accommodation due to age-related sclerotic changes in the lenticular structure and ciliary muscles leading to progressive fall in near vision. The global prevalence of presbyopia is projected to reach 2.1 billion people in 2030. An economic burden in terms of productivity loss is estimated to be over $11 billion annually. Conventionally, presbyopia has been treated with optical correction due to its cost, effectivity, simplicity, and its non-invasive nature. But these options do not attempt to restore true accommodation of the presbyopic eye. So to curtail these challenges, there has been widespread research in presbyopic management. And here are some recent advances that I will be discussing in today's presentation. Corneal inlay is a minimally invasive surgical technique in which a femtosecond laser is used to create a flap or corneal pouch and intrastromal corneal implants are placed under this flap. This technique has advantage of being reversible while providing good near and intermediate visual acuity with higher level of patient satisfaction. Halos, glare, diminished night vision and increased risk of corneal opacification are some of the side effects of this procedure. This table here shows three types of corneal inlays which are currently available in the market. Space occupying inlays with prototype raindrop improves near vision by inducing differential surface curvature change resulting in hyperprolate and multifocal cornea. Refractive annular addition in lenticule inlay that is flexi view acts, works as bifocal optical inlays separating distance and near focal points. Camera that is small aperture inlays utilizes pinhole effect there by increasing the depth of focus. Camera was launched in 2015 and this is only FDA approved synthetic corneal press by pick implants currently available in the market. Dr. Sujan Jacob of India introduced technique of pearl in which a smile lenticule from a serologically tested donor was implanted as corneal inlays. This has advantage of avoiding the pitfalls of corneal melt opacification, etc. associated with previously discussed synthetic corneal implants. Multiple concentric intrastromal rings are made during intracore surgical technique using a femtosecond laser which aims at making hyperprolate and multifocal cornea. Presbylagic surgery is an advancement over monovision LASIK where eczema laser is used to create different power zone in cornea by changing its shape. Scleral extension procedure is based on the SCARCAR theory of accommodation and aims at reversing the process of presbya as a whole by modification of sclera ciliary complex. Presbyo scleral implants are inserted in scleral tunnel posterior to lens equator, which lifts the sclera and ciliary muscle, thus tightening the zonular fibers and thus reversing the process of presbyopia. Laser A surgery uses air yag laser in four oblique quadrants on the sclera over the critical zones of physiological importance as shown here in this slide. This therapy is designed to reduce the age-related ocular rigidity, thereby restoring the accommodative power of the patient. Ocufit system uses electrode placed over lens to stimulate ciliary muscle, thus strengthening these muscles. This procedure can have additive benefit in glaucomatous patient, but the effects are prone to regress over time. Currently, many pharmacological options are under investigation. Drugs which act via pupil modulation works by increasing the depth of field by causing meiosis. Agents currently under investigation are pilocarpine, 
carbacol and acylicidine they are mixed with some tempering agent like bromophenate brimnodine and oxymetazoline which aims to reduce the parasympathomimetic side effect of these patient these agents uh, prototype drugs of uh, unr844 explore the novel mechanism of increasing the lens disulfide content and reduces the age related stiffness this chart here shows various drug combination which are currently in different phases of trial and provide a promising future towards better management of press biopic patient so uh, at last i would like to say that as uncorrected or suboptimal corrected presbya can have considerable impact on patient quality of life a unique and a novel treatment which shows the patient it should be found out thank you Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor Sadhya Ji. Uh, it was uh, excellent presentation, and you stick to the time and to the Thank topic you. also very Thank well you. presented. Thank now, you. judges, uh, it's open for discussion. A uh, very nice presentation, uh, Sadhya Ji. I have just one question. What are the disadvantages of mono vision LASIK? Okay, um, mono vision in mono vision LASIK, we uh, make one eye suitable for near vision and other eye is used for distant vision. This can hamper the stereo acuity of patient. Like if a patient has uh, occupation of pilot, the depth perception perception is hampered in these patient. That is the major disadvantage of mono vision LASIK. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, uh, Dr. Sanjay sir. Very nice presentation regarding press biopsy management. Thank you, sir. And, um, nicely dividing to do surgical and medical options for available press biopsy treatment. Just yes. one question: What are the contraindications that are there for the use of myotic drugs for press biopsy management? Any sir, contraindications? Sir, as uh, these are mostly parasympathomimetic drugs. Like pilocarpine, and so what are whatever the contraindication of parasympathomimetic drugs are, which can uh, can be uh, used in this uh, these patients also. Like if someone has uh, 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 like in pilocarpine, if someone has drug, yeah, cardiovascular uh, problems, etc. So these are the uh, contraindication for these uh, the drugs. Yeah. Well elucidated. Well, that is the systemic uh, correlation. Yeah. Between yeah, yeah. Uh, from the ocular perspective, if the patient has pupil size of less than two point five. Oh yeah, yeah. So because it causes meiosis, but these are uh, these drugs mostly work by causing meiosis. Right. Very well. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Anyone else wants to talk or ask anything or add anything, Doctor Aditi? Uh, basically, pilocarpin and uh, should also be avoided in UBIT cases. Where yes, you, yes, where because it can lead to it can uh, in elevate uh, inflammation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In these these and also, if uh, you are planning any surgery, it should be discontinued. Yes, before yes surgery, any yes. intraocular. That's all. Thank you. Very Thank nice you. presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. With this, we move on to second presentation by Dr. Varshika Patel uh, from GRMC. Uh, her talk will be on a scleral fixated intraocular lenses. And uh, the mentor again is Dr. Shakya. Dr. Varsha, can you share your screen, please? Yes, ma'am. Is it visible? Yes, you can go ahead. You are audible also. Good evening, everyone. Myself, Dr. Varshika. Today, I will be presenting on scleral fixated IOLs. The goals of my presentation are to get the basic understanding of SF IOLs, where to use them and when not to prefer, and what are the various techniques available for the same. And routinely, IOLs are placed in the capsular bag, but some conditions cause hindrance in these, like zonular weakness or posterior capsular rupture, which can be handled by some other measures, like fixating IOLs to iris or sclera and simply placing it in the anterior chamber. But problems like corneal endothelial decompensation, pupillary block, and angle closure are more common with AC IOLs and iris-fixated lenses. 
and uh, let and comparatively these are less in SFIUs which are preferred over them. Also, SFIUs provide better long-term ocular safety in terms of fixation and centration. Indications of SFIUs include surgical correction of aphakia, subluxation or dislocation of lens, which may be due to trauma or ectopia lentis, and insufficient capsular back support for conventional IUL lens placement. Uh, following conditions must be kept in mind before uh, in which the SFIULs are better to be avoided, like in ocular inflammations, uveitis, uncontrolled glaucoma, filtering blood, and other conditions are also listed here. Choice of IULs completely depends upon the surgeon owing to the type of surgical technique they want to perform. For example, in suture technique, one-piece rigid IULs are preferred, whereas in sutureless techniques, we prefer three-piece small foldable IUL lenses. Talking about the power modification, it has to be done depending on the calculated capsular band IULs. For suturing, non-absorbable sutures like proline, polypropylene, and Goretex are preferred. Before moving on to the further surgical details, these, princip uh, these principles need to be kept in mind for better uh, uh, centration of IUL. Techniques for uh, in uh, techniques available for SF IULs are sutured IULs, which are complex procedures, which needs expertise and better durability is there, and long term results are also good. And in sutureless techniques, the, it, these are easy and quick, and good IUL centration is there, and suture related complications are avoided in these techniques. Moving on to the uh, external technique, in these techniques, uh, the sutures are passed from outside of the eye to the inside. In these partial thickness level flaps, flaps are made 180 degree apart and suture needle is passed via one flap, one mm from the limbus and 27 gauge needle is passed inside uh, uh, beneath the second flap. The suture needle is docked into the 27 gauge needle in anterior chamber. Suture is pulled out from the corneal section and ends are tied to the eyelids of the heptic and the IOL is placed inside the eye and then suture, these suture ends are, at the scleral flap are tied beneath them and flaps are reposited. In internal technique, sutures are passed from inside of the eye to the outside via a scleral flap emerging from the ciliary sulcus. And this technique provides a blind move and therefore unpredictable placement of heptic is there. Hoffman described a technique in which pressure uh, reverse scleral pockets are made 180 degrees apart. After the placement of optic of IUL in the eye, sutures are retrieved from the uh, pockets through the corneal incision and tied, and the knots are then buried inside the scleral pockets. Advantage of this technique is it avoids conjunctival dissection and scleral cauterization. A direct visualization of ciliary sulcus can be ensured by an endoscopic assisted IUL technique as well. Moving on further to the sutureless techniques. In sutureless techniques, the first category we have is uh, glueless IUL technique, in which the sclerotomies are created 1 mm from the limbus and 2 to 3 mm intrascellar tunnels are created by 26 gauge needles, and heptics are exteriorized, dug into the tunnels, and these flaps are then sealed by the glue. In intrascellar haptic fixation, that is Shreyor technique. The uh, uh, rest of the steps are similar to the glue, uh, glued IUL technique, but uh, in the last part, the heptics are fed into the tunnel without using any glue or sutures. Recently, in 2017, a sutureless, glueless, and a flapless technique was discovered, which was a transconjunctival scleral fixation technique described by Yamani, which provided early visual recovery. In, in this, steps are similar to the glued IUL technique, except in the last part of the surgery, where instead of using glue, the tips are exter exteriorized, heptics are cauterized, and these phalanges are put, put back into the sclera. <coughs> Complications of SF IUL techniques can range from early corneal edema, intraocular bleeding, IOP fluctuations in the immediate post-operative period to the complications like cystoid macular edema and later pupillary capture of IUL, conjunctival erosion of suture, IUL tilt, scleral thinning with heptic exposure can also be there. Risk of tilt and decentration are more with two-point fixation I'm techniques. Not... The pref uh, my take-home messages are preferred technique of secondary IUL implantation is SF IUL in defective and weak capsular support and long-term visual outcomes are also good there. Suture techniques are preferred over sutureless, and though this is a surgically demanding procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Varshika, for uh, your wonderful presentation, and you have covered the topic very well. And uh, now judges can ask the question. Oh, very nice presentation. Congratulations. 
I just want to ask one thing that yes. uh, what is the power difference when you calculate IOL power difference? Uh, like uh, mostly you do for uh, posterior capsular, uh, posterior bag fixation IOL and that for scleral fixation. What is the difference? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, since in this scleral fixation technique, we are placing IOLs quite anterior to the capsular bag. So the power has to be redu reduced from the uh, calculations done for the capsular bag. And this depends upon the range of the power. For the higher powers, we deduct minus one. And for the lower powers, like up to 17 I, uh, diopter, we reduce 0.5. And below this, there is no reduction done in the capsular bag. So standard we take uh, like one, uh, around one, we deduce whatever power we have calculated. So standard is one. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Anyone else? Retina people? Yeah, Dr. Varshika, nice presentation. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Just one question. Is there an option available for scleral fixation of a traumatic aniridium with a fake here? There was no mention of such a thing. See, whenever, why are we using scleral fixated when there is a fake here? Or sometimes associated trauma leads to even loss of people. So, is there an yes. option available in scleral fixated IOLs for such conditions? Mm, so, I said I don't have idea about this. So, we have scleral fixated NIRED IOLs also available. That should be okay. there in your armamentarium. So, okay. in these typical conditions, you can use scleral fixated NIRED IOLs. Yes. Okay. There is a loss of people with associated with trauma. Okay. Sir. Yeah, otherwise, nice presentation. Thank you. Manchu. Please unmute. Um, I think she has covered everything. Nice presentation, really nice thank, presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Jazis. Uh, with this, we move on to our third presentation, which is by Dr. Varsha Sharma. She will be presenting on traumatic glaucoma and uh, mentor is Dr. Rashmi. Welcome, Dr. Rashmi. She has joined. Audible. Yes, you are audible. And your slides are visible. You can start, please. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you can start. Yes. Good evening, everyone. My uh, topic is traumatic glaucoma. Traumatic glaucoma, uh, the incidence of ocular trauma is 7 per 1,000 population per year. And the risk of developing glaucoma are more with blunt trauma. And young men are more prone. Predictors for development of chronic glaucoma are poor vis initial visual acuity, degree of trabecular pigmentation, high femur, lens injury, and angle recession of more than 180 degree. Following trauma, there could be decrease in IOP and increase in IOP. Decrease in IOP can be due to aqueous hyposecretion, increased uvus scleral outflow as seen with cyclodialysis cleft, and trabecular meshwork tear extending to clumps, clumps canal. Increased IOP can be due to open angle and closed angle. Open angle causes are uh, pre-trabecular, trabecular, and post-trabecular, and closed angle can be due to anterior push mechanism and posterior, uh, post anterior pull mechanism and posterior push mechanism. Blunt trauma causes anterior posterior compression by as much as 41% and as the fluid is incompressible, it will lead to equatorial expansion by 128%, which will lead to injury to ocular tissues. Campbell beautifully described the seven rings of circumferentially oriented ocular tissues anterior to equator that are forced to expand and thus become damaged and, uh, and are shown in the diagram. Presentation can be early onset and late onset. In, uh, if early uh, gonoscopy will be done in the cases of increased IOP, it will sometimes show no normal findings in cases of contusion injury to trabecular meshwork and it can show tear in the trabecular meshwork which will lead to scarring and ultimately late IOP rise. Hyphema is the most common cause of early presentation of glaucoma and one third of hyphema patients show increase in IOP and it will increase up to 65% in, uh, in cases of re-bleeding. Larger hyphema has more chances of clot detection, so hence re-bleed more commonly, which starts after three to five days. Hence, size of hyphema is useful indicator of visual prognosis and glaucoma. Mechanism of glaucoma in hyphema is occlusion of trabecular meshwork by blood clot and erythrocyte debris. Management is medical management by aqueous suppression, topical steroids, and cycloplegic agent. 
सर्जिकल मैनेजमेंट इज बाई एंटर चैम्बर लेवाज एंड इंडिकेशन ऑफ एंटर चैम्बर लेवाज इज ग्रेड थ्री और फोर हाइफीमा नॉट रिस्पॉन्डिंग टू मेडिकल ट्रीटमेंट इंट्रोकुलर प्रेशर ऑफ मोर देन फिफ्टी एम एम एच जी फॉर फोर टू फाइव डेज और मोर देन थर्टी फाइव एम 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 ऑफ मर्करी फॉर सेवन डेज द थ्रेश होल्ड फॉर एंटर चैम्बर लेवाज इज लेस इन केस ऑफ सिकल सेल डिजीज chemical injury causes glaucoma more commonly with alkaline agent and shows immediate elevation of intraocular pressure followed by hypotony followed by late iop elevation angle recession is the commonest cause of late onset glaucoma only 7 to 9% of angle recession develop glaucoma and it is the separation between the longitudinal and circular fibers of ciliary body muscle mechanism of glaucoma in ca case of angle recession is proliferative of degenerative changes in the trabecular meshwork which will lead to scarring and ultimately obstruction of aqueous outflow more than 180 degree of angle recession has higher chances of glaucoma and it shows a bimodal pattern on gonioscopy broad ciliary body band will be seen and the treatment is by iop lowering agents or trabeculectomy with metabolite and the mechanism of host cell glaucoma is which will seen in resolving vitreous hemorrhage is obstruction of trabecular meshwork by host cell which gain access to anterior chamber through disrupted anterior hyaluronic hyaluronic phase the lens induced glaucoma is a group of secondary glaucoma that has the lens as a factor in cause of iop elevation and and it can it can be due to dislocation and subluxation lens swelling on lens particle obstructing trabecular meshwork epithelial downgrowth will seen in the penetrating trauma and patent fistula which will lead to abnormal introduction of epithelial cells into the anterior chamber and it proliferate over trabecular meshwork leads to raised iop regmatogenous retinal detachment usually shows hypotony but in their 5 to 10% cases it will show increased iop and it is called as squat syndrome the siderotic glaucoma is a late manifestation of iron containing foreign body and it is it can be present as classic triad shown in the diagram my take home message message is hyphema is the most common cause of both early and late presentation of glaucoma and a detailed examination and regular follow up is necessary in every case of trauma thank you thank you dr varsha for uh, elaboration of uh, traumatic glaucoma thank you now the judges can ask her a question because it's a very huge topic uh, and it is very 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 important even a small blunt injury can give rise to a glaucoma and patient may not be aware of that injury or may forgot this injury because it happened in the past so let us discuss this topic in case of blunt trauma which is the single imaging modality you would like to use varsha very nice presentation thank you ma'am uh, ma'am ultra bio microscopy yes why um because ma'am uh, we can uh, it shows the uh, both and uh, the uh, it shows the entire segment and and the part behind the iris also can be seen through ubm yes basically ubm and as oct they can be used but ubm has got a better penetration mm -hmm. and the structures behind the iris such as the ciliary zone use and the status of the lens they can be visualized mm -hmm. better with ubm thank you varsha thank you ma'am Uh, Doctor Varsha. Yes, sir. Okay, so my question is, which is more dangerous, a lens in the anterior or lens in the posterior segment after trauma? Mm, so lens in the, uh, I I think lens so in the anterior. Oh, there is anterior, correct? Why? Yes, sir. So because it can also cause it can close glaucoma and it can also cause endothelial decompensation. Yeah. Good. very nice presentation dr varsha i would just like to ask in case of for trauma uh, like if you get a hyphema so what are the indications for ac wash or surgical intervention in case of post trauma hyphema causing glaucoma ma'am grade 3 or 4 hyphema or uh, total hyphema which will not responding to medical treatment and the intraocular pressure of more than 50 mm of mercury for uh, uh, for 5 days and more than 35 mm of mercury of mercury for 7 days and in sickle cell disease uh, 20 uh, the threshold is less at uh, it, uh, because the sickle cell patients are more prone to optic neuropathy uh, they are already uh, compromised uh, their vasculature is all, all, already compromised and in so in that ca cases more than 25 mm of mercury for 24 hours or uh, 35 30 mm hg spikes are seen if then in that case we will do anterior chamber lavage 
Yes, uh, very good. Uh, recently, American Academy, they have advocated that uh, there are three major indication that you should uh, go on early intervention. Uh, five days, more than 25, not responding to medical treatment, the fullest medical treatment you are giving, mm -hmm. more than 60 for 48 hours, and then uh, corneal blood staining. If you get all three, uh, like any of the three, you mm -hmm. need to restore uh, to the surgical management quite early. Dr. Varsha, what is the cause of increase in pressure in Schwartz syndrome? Ma'am, because of the uh, obstruction of trabecular meshwork by photoreceptors outer segment. Okay. And when you see these uh, brown pigments in the anterior vitreous phase, what is that known as? Brown pigments in... In, uh, in case of regmatogenous RD, you see the brown pigments in vitreous, that sign is known as? I don't know. Okay. Okay. That is Sheffer sign. Sheffer sign. Yes, ma'am. Sheffer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. With this, we move on to fourth presentation from uh, GRMC. Uh, that is Dr. Shreya Tripathi. She will be presenting on ocular findings of rheumatoid arthritis. And... Uh, Mentor is Dr. Prabhagupta. Dr. Sreya, please mute yourself. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Shreya, are you ready? Please unmute Dr. Shreya. <clears throat> Hello? Ma 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 Hello? Yes, yes, you are audible and yes. you are visible also. You can start. Good evening, everyone. Today I will be presenting my topic on ocular manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic inflammatory. Yes, you can present. It's visible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic inflammatory disease with type 3 uh, hypersensitivity reaction. Today, we will be focusing on its ocular manifestations. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis has a prevalence of 0.5 to 2% in general population, more commonly seen in females in fourth uh, to fifth decade of their life. It is associated with HLA-DR4 an extra articular manifestation in 10 to 20 percent of uh, patients frequently uh, seen in zero positive patients. Family history of rheumatoid arthritis is also important. Like joint, the sclera and cornea have proteoglycans and collagens that are responsible for immune complex uh, deposition and uh, cytokine pro uh, production. These cause the inflammatory insult to these structures, leading to several ocular manifestations, which are listed here. Further, we will be discussing each one of them in uh, detail. Firstly, uh, keratoconjunctivitis secca, seen in 10 to 35 percent patients of RA. Decrease in tear production is due to secondary gland atrophy caused by the infiltration of uh, infiltration of B or T lymphocytes in lacrimal gland. For precautionary measure, environmental and habitual modifications are required and therapeutically lubricating eye drops are given. Topical cyclosporins can also be considered. Moving to episcleritis, it is a mild self-limiting recurrent disease seen in approximately 5% patients of rheumatoid arthritis. It can be a simple episcleritis or nodular uh, episcleritis. Nodular is seen in prolonged at attacks of um, inflammation seen in chronic rheumatoid arthritis patient. For the treatment of episcleritis, drug of choice is lubricating agents with topical NSAIDs. In case of failure of topical, uh, topical steroids or oral steroids are also considered. Patients with the frequent recurrence of disease modifying agents can be used. For scleritis, we know it is a very painful and a chronic potentially blinding inflammatory disease. Rheumatoid uh, arthritis account for 8 to 15 percent of the cases of scleritis, but only 2 percent patient of RA will develop scleritis. 
for uh, anterior scleritis it can manifest as diffuse nodular necrotizing or uh, scleromalacia perforans necrotizing scleritis has a acute devastating course and scleromalacia perforans is seen in elderly women uh, with long standing uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, posterior scleritis can present as a serous uh, retinal detachment or a corio retinal fold uh, a classic t sign is seen uh, on b scan finding for treatment of scleritis a close cooperation between rheumatologist and ophthalmologist is required in patient with necrotizing scleritis with or without puk uh, it needs a early and aggressive treatment with uh, intravenous methylprednisolone further immunological uh, Im immunomodulators can be added for long term, -term treatment in case of any other type of scleritis oral prednisolones are given in case of corticosteroid dependence uh, immunomodular agents are uh, considered in case of failure uh, in case of failure to these agents uh, we can give the treatment of biological agents like infliximab uh, now on to the corneal changes Peri peripheral ulcerative keratitis show corneal mesh at periphery uh, due to immune complex infiltration ra accounts for about 34% of the cases of puk it is treated by systemic uh, corticosteroids with or without immunological agents other non ulcerative corneal changes are persistent epithelial defect sclerosing uh, keratitis acute stromal keratitis or acute uh, corneal melt for this condition uh, a judicious use of topical steroid should be considered as uh, to avoid the risk of perforation uh, tissue adhesive can also be used in case of corneal melt uh, now on to uh, retinal vasculitis which is a painless and a asymptomatic condition can be seen in 1 to 5% patients of rheumatoid arthritis uh, uh, fundus shows exudate and uh, macular edema the site threatening ocular manifestation in this disease include uh, necrotizing scleritis and puk these conditions indicate presence of a progressing systemic disease with uh, systemic vasculitis uh, this... you can continue but uh, surgery uh, surgery like pterygium and scleral buckling can be complicated by posterior surgical scleritis or corneal melt hence uh, perioperative prednisolone is given to these patients use of hydroxy chloroquine uh, can cause toxic megalopathy or bullous eye uh, bullous eye in the retina and hence regular follow up is required steroids are responsible for risk of glaucoma and require routine examination in refractive cases anti tnf uh, agents are recommended ongoing studies are there for the potential role in rheumatoid arthritis thank you for your patience Thank you, Dr. Shreya, for nicely presenting the ocular findings of rheumatoid. Thank you, ma'am. Judges, please. Dr. Shreya, nice. okay, ma'am, you can you can. No, no, you continue, Karan. Uh, Dr. Shreya, uh, if you are starting a patient on methotrexate, disease modifying agent, what monitoring you will do for the patient? Ma'am, see the. Mem serum uh, creatinine should be monitored. What else? Mem. Uh, Sorry, ma'am. You need to uh, monitor his uh, her his or her CBC and the DLC to look whether the patient is not going into immunosuppression. You need to check for the renal function test and for the liver function test. All yes. these must be monitored. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, very nice presentation, Shreya. I have just one question: that are there any laboratory markers in rheumatoid arthritis patients which, if positive, they show a greater predisposition in that patient for developing ocular manifestations or extra ocular extra articular manifestations? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, RA factor and anti CCP agents are responsible for uh, high. a patient with the zero positive with these uh, markers will show more predisposition for extra uh, articular manifestation mem uh, csr uh, mem esr can also be seen uh, esr and uh, uh, c uh, c crp crp and uh, esr are also responsible for the uh, monitoring of 
are emitted at right yes very good actually those patients who are positive for both anti ccp antibodies as well as the rheumatoid factor they have greater predisposition rather than if only anti ccp antibodies are present because they show an advanced stage of the disease thank you shreya very nice thank you ma'am dr shreya nice presentation okay. you you mentioned the t sign how does it help us differentiate between scleritis types uh sir t sign can be seen uh, in b scan uh, sir uh, it uh, signifies that there is a edema in the tendon area the tendon capsule and the optic nerve area and it helps us in differentiating between between posterior scleritis and uh, anterior scleritis so because posterior scleritis is a uh, silent condition it cannot be seen from the uh, sir Sir, on the anterior uh, anterior examination, so fine. You are nicely answered. There, there is also associated coronal thickening. Number one, does the T sign resolve as the disease progress or as you treat the patient? Yes, sir. A sir, T sign uh, will resolve, sir, because there will be progressive decrease in edema uh, as the uh, treatment is progressed. Thank you. now we move ahead to fifth presenter dr niharika chorasia uh, she is from ratan jyot netralay and she will be presenting a smile that is a small incision lenticular extraction and the mentor is dr purendra musi dr niharika are you ready yes ma'am good evening ma'am ma'am am i audible yes you are audible ma'am my slides are visible ma'am yes yes thank, thank you, you. okay uh good evening everybody so i am dr niharika i will be presenting on smile under the mentorship of dr purain basin sir i have no financial interest okay so smile is acronym for small incision lenticular extraction it uh, in it uses only femtosecond laser to carve out a lenticule within the corneal stroma and then achieve refractive correction by extracting the lenticule through a small incision so it uses femtosecond laser which is a which, which causes photal dissection in contrast to lasik which uses excimer laser to cause uh, photo ablation so both these laser uh, lies on the opposite end of the visual uh, spectrum so smile is the uh, paradigm shift in the refractive surgery from sur flap surgery to flapless surgery uh, in 2016 us fda approved visumax for myopia correction uh, from minus 1 diopter cylindrical to minus 8 diopter spherical uh, astigmatism of uh, 0.5 diopter uh, cylindrical or less so this is a visumax uh, machine Uh, it involves four uh, surgical steps docking femtosecond laser application lenticular dissection and lenticular extraction this is a small video which shows a uh, smile procedure uh, so uh, this is a post uh, posterior lamellar dissection and anterior lamellar cut and the side cut the lenticule is uh, dissected and uh, extracted so in docking we we have to fixate the uh, ask the patient to fixate on the green internal fixation line for good centration and apply the suction pressure of 35 mm of mercury uh, there is a contact glass and uh, uh, this is a, this is a image showing contact uh, glass uh, after that we have to apply uh, femtosecond laser application it involves four steps infrared illumination to confirm the sun centration of the docking then uh, posterior lenticular surface cut which is a refractive cut in this laser application is done in spiral in pattern after that anterior lenticular surface cut which uh, is the corneal cap in which we do a uh, laser application in spiral out pattern then there is a side uh, cap side cut uh, which is a 2 to 4 mm incision advantages of smile over lasik is are since it's a, it's a flapless procedure and a relatively small uh, incision is given so there are lesser chances of dry eye and we uh, overcome the complications of flap uh, flap related complication 
So there's a meta-analysis study which shows that uh, SMILE was superior in preserving the corneal biomechanical strength after uh, surgery. And uh, this is another study which shows that the optical quality after SMILE was relatively superior uh, as compared to LASIK. And, but this surgery has, it, uh, has a steep learning curve, so there are interoperative problems. Uh, there is suction loss during docking. So these, this shows that uh, the management of suction loss during different st uh, steps, uh, different stages of suction loss, uh, they can be opaque bubble layer if the suction is applied to too high. They can be black spot if uh, if uh, femtosecond laser is not applied in some area. They can be lenticule decentration, black air island, or smile wound tear or cap rupture during the dissection. The limitations of SMILE are, it is not approved for hypropia, there is no inbuilt tracker, it is, uh, there is no available moda modality for re-SMILE enhancement as there is in uh, femtosecond LASIK. We can perform circle procedure, however. Uh, in circle procedure, it is a program uh, which uh, is specifically uh, present in VisuMath machine in which the fem femtosecond laser uh, cuts the smile cap into the femtosecond LASIK flap. To conclude, smile complications are rare. Uh, rare. Uh, it has steep learning curve. Thus, it is limited to smaller range of refractive error, and it should not be used in patients of corneal scars. However, the study shows that uh, there is a, a, a similar outcomes in smile and uh, LASIK. Uh, it is how, uh, an upcoming refractive procedure, and uh, it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Niharika, for your wonderful presentation on a smile. Now the topic is open for discussion. Niharika, very nice presentation. Can you elaborate a few post-operative complications or post-operative advice that you need to give to your patient or count during the counseling you have to counsel them? Uh, Ma'am, uh, we should uh, tell the patient that there can be a post-operative haze after the surgery of smile or uh, there can be a chance that uh, we have to abort the surgery uh, and uh, a patient should not rub the eye also. And yes, ma'am. Uh, so most importantly, you have to tell the any refractive procedure or corneal surface procedure you are planning. If you are planning, you have to tell the patient about the risk of dryness and you have to assess the your patient. A patient for dryness, yes. Dryness before proceeding for such procedures. Anyways, very nice presentation, Yarika. Thank you, ma'am. Very as well as the regression, smile extra can be done. Thank you, Neharika. Very nice present. Thank you, uh, Dr. Neharika. Sir, sir, please go ahead. Yeah, Iman Shukandi, go ahead. Go ahead with your question. Okay, uh, Neharika, what is the wavelength of light that is used in smile? Uh, sir, uh... Uh, 1,063. Uh, 1, uh, yeah. Very good. And in LASIK? Uh, so it's a uh, excimer laser, so uh, 800 uh, something. 193. Okay. So let's see, you said 193 laser is called as photoablation. Yes. So sir. what is called as 1064? What is the laser when you do 1064? What is the what it's called? So this is called as photoablation. So what is that called? So photo dissection. Hmm? Yes, sir. It starts with D, but not dissection. Uh, uh, photo disruption, sir. Exactly. Yes, and where do you use photo disruption apart from smile? In a very regular procedure. Every ophthalmologist does that. 1064 laser. Sir, is yeah, laser. cap, sir. Oh, right, right, right. And what happens in photo disruption? Sir, the collagen bonds are broken. So, uh, sorry, the carbon bonds are broken. Uh, uh, the, plas uh, the cytoplasm is heat yeah. up and the, it took. Uh, there, there is a formation of. Uh, iron. Sir, 
and it I know. relaxes. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, great. You know it. That's great. That's great. Okay. Dr. Niharika, nice presentation. Just one question. Uh, you have opened up a Pandora's box of uh, flap versus flapless. Uh, what does LASIK treat and smile does not treat? Sir, uh, LASIK can treat hyperopia, sir. But uh, currently, smile is not approved for hyperopia. And? Mm -hmm. Sir, astigmatism also. And no, astigmatism can be treated with smile up to three adapters. Uh, yes, sir. It, it is being done currently, but uh, it still has to be approved by the FDA, sir. You cannot know, treat the higher order operations with smile procedure. You can treat the higher order operations with LASIK procedure. With an eczema, you can treat the higher order operations. I yes, sir. All the higher order operations. Otherwise, nice presentation. There's one more thing that you could add on to your presentation, the amount of the bed that you can leave after smile and after LASIK. After smile, it's even lesser than that. As yes, sir. In LASIK, you, can leave, you should be leaving 300 microns. 300 microns, yes. Smile, you can even go down to even 250 microns, the yes. size of the after the refractor. Otherwise, nice presentation, Yarika. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, judges, and thank you, participants. Um, is Dr. Shakya is there, so he can give the concluding remark. Sir was there when I saw him. Okay, so with this, uh, we have come to end of our Gallier session. Only five pages presented nicely. Uh, uh, now it's a time to declare the results. Dr. Uh, Pankaj Chaudhary is not there, so I'm doing on his behalf. He has compiled all the sheets very well and uh, scored in the form of a percentage. And uh, to my surprise, the percentage from all the 11 PGs from Bhopal it varies between 74.16 to 81. So a very tough competition and uh, our judges uh, has done a wonderful job of uh, selecting first three. So from my side, all our winners because they have presented so well just to complete our uh, list of uh, one, two, three. Otherwise, I'm going to share this whole list to the Bhopal group. So uh, in line, the third is 78.5%. And uh, doctor is Dr. Sumita Chaturvedi, how to assess stosis. Then uh, second will, uh, is on 79%. So only there is a difference of 0.5%. So on second rank uh, is uh, Dr. Amir Munshi. Uh, he has presented fungal corneal as uh, management. And any guesses for uh, first position? So the first position is uh, with 81%. And the name is Dr. Mehek Gupta. She presented how to read a single HVF printout. So congratulations to all the winners, mentors, judges, and all the coordinators who has done such an elaborative work of doing this sheet in a compiled manner. Probably I'm going to share this sheet if uh, all PGs wants. That's for their benefit so that they can further improvise in the future because it's just a neck to neck, only 0.5 difference. Um, a very good uh, start with Bhopal. And now we, uh, we have come to concluding uh, part of our Gaulier uh, webinar. Now our next webinar will be in line is Indore alphabetically, I suppose. Shweta? This is Indore that we are yes. doing in two parts. Okay. So because there are 15 PGs from uh, Indore, so on 29th, next Saturday, we are dividing uh, uh, out of total 15 PGs. The nine PGs will present in the Indore division. And rest six, though they will be presenting along with the Ujjain division, but their judging has to be done with the Indore itself. So uh, Ujjain division is different. 
uh, in the art division is different because it's a divisional competition amongst the students. So we just for the sake of saving the time and getting a better discussion, we are putting six PGs from uh, MGM Medical College along with Ujjain Division. So next time we will all meet on 29th, 3 to 5 p.m. with Indoor PGs. Thank you so much. Everyone has joined. Dr. Raji wants to say something. Yes, I definitely want to say something. There is a point actually, Vinita. Uh, yes. These topics have been allotted by you. Yes, sir. And to all the PGs. Uh, th there has to be a difference between the year of the PG. First year PG, second year PG and the yes, third year. Yes. yes, that I have kept in the mind. One, fine. There is a one point. Second point is that ki you have allotted those kind of the topics which are really difficult. It's difficult to do justice with those topics. Especially, I, I heard about the tra uh, traumatic glaucoma. Uh, it's such a lengthy topic. It's really difficult for all those students to cover in five minutes time. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult. They are just go on enumerating the, I mean, the conditions only. It's really difficult to make justice to those points. Uh, like I heard about this uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, complications, ocular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. She was, I mean, merely enumerating the conditions. That's all. It's really difficult. So I request if it's possible, it's, it's, if it's possible to give them the selected topics, those topics whereby they really can elaborate, they can understand the topic and they can, uh, because the senior PGs, they are almost like junior consultant. Senior PGs are almost like junior consultant, should be able to understand it, they should be able to elaborate it in a, such a nice manner. They are merely, I mean, just enumerating the uh, points. That's all. This is my opinion. I'm not saying that the judges are the final persons who can make the, uh, the comments, but this is my yes, opinion. Sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. That's really this is our first program. We are doing uh, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Our program. Um, and, ma yes. Excuse me. I would like to interrupt for just for uh, one minute. Uh, very good evening, Rajiv sir. And yes. you very well uh, said this, but uh, to your surprise, it was like the second position held by the Bhopal PG. He is a second year. So nowadays okay. the competition is very tough and the PGs oh. are they are extra smart. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That so it's really encouraging PG. if in the list of winners, a second year or a first year PG is getting a position. So it is actually encouraging to PGs also. And uh, yes, yes, definitely. This program is said that it should encourage the PGs. And but still, days, five minutes time is still very top. 15 days old PG, the first year yes. PG joined recently we presented so well it was a topic a vision uh, charting in a child so okay. he uh, uh, like looking into the first year second year third year we have divided the topics and we have given just him to start with the vision because he was just in the infancy itself okay. so that way uh, the pgs are doing an excellent job and we should not underestimate our pgs they are now a techno savvy they are confident and they can compile the things because there are so many good uh, literature is available. So it is just up to them that how well they can present. Right. And this is the way because it's a competition. And I'm seeing down the line, looking to the number of participants increasing in all the conferences, the time has been allotted to even the faculty and even to present the papers, it is getting smaller and smaller. So that was the idea. Now, in a final round, we are going to have a case, case discussions and followed by a rapid fire round for their knowledge assessment. So it is not only the presentation, it was basically make them aware that how to make the slides, how to present in front so that uh, they will uh, lose all their hesitation and they will learn. Even I have seen that uh, the Gwalior PGs has done better because they have seen Bhopal PGs presenting and they have improvised on the um, things which are being told by our judges. So I have seen a drastic improvement in Gwalior PGs and probably eventually down the line as our program proceeds.
proceeds maybe they are doing better and better yes the as mentioned by dr ramit porwal in the last uh, that you should acknowledge if you have taken any video niharika's video it was mentioned it has been taken from youtube and yes. the surgeon has done and all the pgs completed their presentation well in time of 5 minutes only one exceeded one or two slide but rest all completed in 5 minutes so that's a good time management that how to compile because if you have been given a 20 minutes also you are going to say the same so that's an art of learning that how effectively you can convey your message in a smaller time otherwise the full slides go on reading like a theory book uh, it's not justified that was my intention to make them aware that they have to be very clear crisp and in time correct those certain topics are really difficult uh, as i uh, understood that definitely the traumatic trauma is one which you cannot cover in five and hbf reading the girl who stood first yes <laughs> that so you you should difficult. see that on youtube i have never seen a clear concept of hbf in a third year student presenting for somebody else she may understand but then to make everybody understand so if somebody looks for that in on a youtube that hbf presentation was excellent heart touching and that shows the depth of knowledge to that particular child because once you read probably you understand but once you teach somebody else probably your concepts are so clear that you may read uh, this uh, every time and yeah, you will never going to forget that hvf reading throughout life <laughs> that's why most of the people say that teaching is the best form of the learning yes so excellent job uh, is being done not only by our pgs but mentors in all the medical colleges and now our judges they are devoting their time especially on sunday evening and this time i was at uh, hyderabad so sorry for that that i have shifted my time to 6 because i attended that conference as a faculty till 5:30 and immediately i came up and i'm logged in from the hotel itself <laughs> so next time i want more and more participation even uh, from the consultant side so that they can encourage our budding ophthalmologist thank you so thank much you. each one of you nice initiative dr vinita thank you thank you so much sir uh, it's all team work our judges our uh, scientific uh, Um, members, uh, the member scientific committee of MP State, and then these three coordinators, Dr. Pankaj, Dr. Aditi, and Dr. Shweta, they are doing a wonderful job. And uh, probably we are going to learn and uh, continue this uh, for uh, our uh, subsequent uh, years also. Hopefully, we do well, and we are going to announce these uh, Gwalior uh, results uh, in our next webinar. thank you so much thank you each one of you and thank you ajanta people for making this possible because they are continuous efforts and sapna is all the time uh, uh, they are into this program and i can tell that sapna is more than uh, me in this program every time she says madam ye karna hai madam is bar apne ko wo piche se uh, perceptors of future ka bhi um, क्या बोलते वर्चुअल बैकग्राउंड लगाना है तो तो नेक्स्ट टाइम आई विल इंसिस्ट ऑल ऑफ यू टू प्लीज कम विद दैट वर्चुअल बैकग्राउंड ऑफ परसेप्टर्स ऑफ फ्यूचर सो दैट वी कैन इवन रिमेंबर इन आवर फ्यूचर आल्सो दैट वी हैड दिस काइंड ऑफ अ प्रोग्राम फॉर आवर बडिंग ऑफ टर्मोलॉजी थैंक यू मैम इट इज रियली लर्निंग फॉर मी आल्सो अ ग्रेट डिस्कशन थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू ईच वन ऑफ यू थैंक यू थैंक यू दिस वी क्लोज द मीटिंग थैंक्स अ लॉट थैंक यू Okay